Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hopefully uh, you had a great day today. Uh, my name is Bill Hankard. I'm an IT architect at IBM. And this is Chino. How you doing? Thanks for uh, attending. Uh, Chino Sahu, also an architect. Uh, and uh, Bill will kind of take you through some context of uh, what we do at IBM uh, before we kind of jump into the meat of the presentation. So um, hopefully I'm going to keep you guys awake. You know, I know it's been a long day and it's 5.30 and we got stuck with the end session, but let's try to keep it a little bit interesting. I'm going to kind of go through the slides a little quickly and then we have some Q&A, have questions and we'll get through it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk out this way just because I can't really click and point or, you know, but so um, is this thing working here? No, it isn't working. Sorry about that. Oh, here we go. So what we'd like to get out of this session here is obviously understand why we have a use case for centralized image management within OpenStack. Um, what drove us to this? A little bit of an overview of the IBM hybrid development cloud. This is a hybrid development cloud team within IBM. This is not internet facing. This isn't software. We're an internal team within cloud that supports the various development and support teams and test teams within IBM. We provide services to them. And some of the technologies that we've used to develop this tool chain, Jenkins, Packer, uh, IBM Endpoint Manager for Security, and obviously Microsoft KMS that we use for auto uh, registration of our Windows images. Um, so a little bit of a context here of the mission. We started in 2015 um, we, for all the IBM development teams within the, within the uh, cloud analytics, uh, security teams that needed to leverage OpenStack as we're a fairly large VMware environment and OpenStack is you know, coming along. Um, we wanted to provide a method to have continuous delivery, have them uh, unbounded, give them that OpenStack, uh, here's your project, here's your images, here's your flavors, here's your network, go forward and deliver. And we wanted to step out of the way, we didn't want to inhibit them. So as the OpenStack you know, is growing in, in leaps and bounds within the uh, company, you know, we, we wanted this project and we wanted to basically, you know, have something to deliver to them and sort of step out of the way, have something common, uh, have something that would uh, be global. We have uh, four locations that we're in today, uh, Littleton, Mass, uh, RTP, Carolina, uh, Hursley, England, and Toronto, Canada. So we have global teams. Uh, the need for commonality across all these teams was uh, paramount because a developer could be working on projects in multiple locations. Just to add real quick, I mean, two fundamental business objectives. Oh, yeah, we wanted to, to ensure our user base development teams that build software, build services, we want to make sure they're enabled to do their development in a hybrid context, um, you know, do their dev tests on-prem, uh, and then have the ability to promote that workload or promote that uh, um, offering out into our public cloud. Um, and then also enable them with the tools and self-service capabilities to do uh, continuous delivery. You know, deliver more frequently, deliver auto in an automated way, um, adopt more of the DevOps practices that, that we're trying to champion uh, within our company and really across the industry. Thanks, Jim. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of our cloud here, and I'm going to use the laser pointer to kind of point out some of the things here. So obviously we have our OpenStack dashboard, and for those of you that are in my way here, I'm sorry. Um, so here's our dashboard. We use Jenkins. We use Stack like Grafana um, over here, basically our uh, you know, login page. And one of the things that we did with our users was this uh, lobby project. And so we created a project with an OpenStack and all the clouds. And we told users they had sort of a try and buy, go in there, kick the tires. Do you like it? You know, is it going to work for you? As they adopted it, then we engage them and we create projects and then start, you know, onboarding them to our environment. And, you know, we use Slack. Um, right here we have GitHub. We have a product called BluePay. That's a custom application within IBM that we charge our clients for uh, that come in to uh, leverage our cloud resources. So you you can kind of think of it as OpenStack Plus, you know, as a service. We used OpenStack as the base and then built a lot of functionality around and on top of it, um, automating a lot of our business processes that are specific to um, you know, corporate tools, uh, corporate processes, 
Um, and today we're going to actually focus on the image, uh, the imaging, the image piece of this, the image customization and the uh, image replication and, and, and kind of syncing that across all of our clouds. So just a little bit of an overview of our environment is here on the right hand side would be within the IBM intranet and obviously we're using you know, GitHub, um, we have uh, obviously OpenStack, we have it in these four different locations. We use Spectrum Scale, which is GPFS for storage, Cinder, Nova, and Glance. Obviously Open Switch, vSwitch for networking. Stack like Grafana, Kibana, and Nagios, monitoring the network, uh, monitoring the OpenStack infrastructure, getting alerts when certain the services within OpenStack aren't responding, good little tool. Um, right here is our security tool within IBM that we have to ensure that our images, when they're on the IBM intranet, are, they're compliant, they're patched, they have the appropriate antiviruses, they have the appropriate password policies, and they meet our uh, business guidelines. Uh, this is our ticketing system. We use that for support. IBM Cloud Desk is uh, basically if a user has a problem, they submit a ticket, pretty much similar to other ticketing systems. Blue pages and blue groups, this is our LDAP authentication. We've wired in, uh, in the previous screen, I can show you right here. So right here, we basically wire all that in. That's my IBM intranet ID into our corporate blue pages uh, directory. So we don't have to use any on-prem LDAP. We don't have to use any uh, active directory. We have everything within the corporate directory that we can use. So it's a lot easier for users. Also, it's a lot easier for us with these blue groups because we do use blue groups, um, LDAP groups, to lock down and segregate projects from each other and give people access within the OpenStack infrastructure. And as I showed you previously, BluePay, which is a you know, usage and chargeback tool that we use. Uh, right over here, so basically we have the uh, interconnects into our software labs, so we have dedicated links from each one of the labs and the locations that don't traverse the IBM intranet. Typically, the IBM intranet you know, is in each location. They go through a blue code proxy somewhere out to the internet. These are directly into the pods within software. We use these high-speed file, uh, high file transfers to move data from the labs within software that folks have content or images or operating um, OpenStack environments, operating system, anything could be out there that they need to move data from their uh, continuous delivery model. Um, and let's see right here, our cloud registry, uh, blue box, and let's see other here, I can't really see that. Yeah, uh, IT SaaS, the same thing here. So that's really an overview of our environment. Um, pretty large, a uh, little complex, but um, you know, that's, that's the lay of the land. And, you know, like I said, we fo we're focusing mainly on the uh, image repo that we're going to talk about a little bit more, but I just want to give you a bit of an overview of how we're using OpenStack within our environment. All right. So the problem here is images, obviously, are what our users are going to use. Uh, as we see the patches, everybody, you know, loves to patch, and, you know, OS gets non-compliant, and, uh, you know, Things ha happen out there, uh, VMs sit out there, people don't patch, don't you know, put antiviruses, problems happen, and then we have sometimes issues. So as you see, when it first started out, we have a nice pretty house, and then we end up with the decayed house and an old micro bus sitting next to it, which isn't good. So you know, we needed to basically address this issue. I mean, I'm as guilty as the next as I was creating my own images in my location, I was promoting them to my cloud, you know, Chino's doing the same, and we all kind of gathered together to say, listen, we shouldn't be doing this. We should have a central team doing this. We should basically coordinate this and have one central team managing, coordinating it where we can save time, uh, reduce duplication of effort. Yeah, I mean, I think the message here is you got to take care of your images. You got to take care of your instances. We don't want people to do it, so let's uh, build a tool or uh, build automation um, and then take care of the automation instead of having to take care of the images themselves. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And so the case for change, as I said, eliminate the duplication of effort, you know, improve how we deliver the images, you avoid the images getting out of, out of date, out of patching, and obviously provide that consistent user experience across all clouds. Like I said, we're in four locations. We want to ensure if a developer that logs in for, to Hursley, England, has an Ubuntu 14.04 image, is using it, is the same user experience as they log into the RTP cloud. So we try to keep that level of consistency the same across all the clouds. 
Okay, and as you see right here, we have a pretty, you know, this is just a, a snippet of all the different permutations of what we have, I'm sorry, uh, a snippet of the permutations of all the different operating systems and potentially what packages people may want on them. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the next few slides. I mean, so, our users are not different than most users. They're, they're gonna want a base OS image plus something else. And so instead of having them just import their own image into their project, uh, we want them to kind of follow the standard process uh, that'll end up spitting out an image that um, will be compliant out of the box, um, will have what they need, and will be maintained over the long term um, by the automation that we have in place. Uh, but you'll see that this, the, this is slide really illustrates the problem. There's just so many different combinations that uh, it's a scale problem mm -hmm. and we want to standardize that approach. Okay, thanks, Jim. So here we are at a high level, the solution that, uh, and luckily today we have one of our developers here that has helped uh, develop this product, which is really neat. Um, so really, uh, I'm going to stand over this way and kind of go over at a high level right here of, um, Oops, sorry about that, I keep hitting the wrong button. So really what it is, is we want to publish a compliant OS every 30 days to an image catalog. That image synchronization uh, gets detected. We do an image sync to the different clouds and the different locations. And then if a customer has a requirement to say, hey, I want Java, I want DB2, I want you know, uh, Nginx, they basically make that request and that will, that will basically trigger the synchronization and then the image customization will happen automatically. So the image reposit repository right here is uh, available um, throughout the IBM intranet. Folks can sync to that. There's a uh, global storage area where they can pull those different images and it's a cron task that runs every night to pull this data down. So here is the manufacturing, starting the manufacturing process of the base image. And I can go over here. So basically, we start with an ISO, you know, like an Ubuntu ISO. We bring it in, um, and then we load it into Glance. And then the Cinder Create, we do a Nova boot. We create the uh, VM. So we create the VM and create a volume with that. And then that gets pu published um, into uh, Glance. So once that's in the Glance repository, then, as you see right here, here's the VM right there, um, and there's the Glance image repository right there. The Jenkins job gets kicked off right here. And basically, you know, we do uh, a Jenkins job that talks to the master. And so, for example, in this case, we're going to probably be building Ubuntu. And so the job starts off. It does a clone of the image. It starts uh, Packer, which is the OpenStack builder orchestration tool. And then we start this, these different steps through there as we walk through the manufacturing of each one of these pieces. And some of these, set are, uh, you know, some of these processes are optional, but some can be run. And then we run a test. We then copy the metadata. Now this right here, the IT SAS registration in a scan, this is our security tool where we need to register our images within our security tool. We need to also scan it for any vulnerabilities, open ports, and then essentially what happens in our IT SaaS pool is a, um, a floating operating system record gets created and the security system now says that this is a valid image, it's compliant. The end user that eventually gets this image will be uh, compliant from day one once they get it. So then once that is complete, if there's a failure, obviously you know, we get notification, we use Slack, uh, the build team will get notification of that. Um, it is then published up to GSA. So GSA is our IBM Global Storage Architecture. It is based on GPFS. It's a clustered file system. It's available all around the world. This is where the cron job um, pulls to, if, to the different locations among, among IBM. So I'm going to just stop right there. Um, right here is kind of a busy chart. Questions right now? I mean, I'll take some questions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is, yes. Do you have a base image first, which you append on? Steve, I, if you could uh, feel uh, Yeah, that's right. Um, we start with the base image and then Packer. Um, 
does the stuff, make it compliant, installs security tools. So yeah, we sort of basic image and then Packer um, does the stuff, make it compliant. Do you have a basic image apart from uh, Talbot? No. Basic image is not this one. All it does is it's a bare operating system. So it's a bare operating system, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I know it's a bit of a eye chart here, but trying to get, trying to break down the the methodology that uh, we used here. So the image customization, and this is the point where um, if a image was published and the end user wanted, say, uh, some different package on it, we could trigger another job that would install Java, um, and then it would be to their project. They would get that delivered to their project. They would have a customized image for their usage. And once again, as you see through here, it goes through, and the job runs the plugin, you know, Packer, the notification through Slack, and then it puts in some of these job params here. Yeah, and the user actually defines what they want in their image in, uh, in, their, in a GitHub uh, repo that we share. They define what they want in the image, and then that gets pushed as the inputs through the Jenkins job to um, build the image and then push out to the cloud. Question. That is correct, yes, yes. Yeah, there's a customization job that can run if they want to separate, because the, the, on the onset, right, we didn't want to hit every permeate, you know. It, we wanted to provide a base image, and then it's up to the developer what he or she wants, but then we, need, we knew there was the need for, of course, it's not going to just be straight Ubuntu, they're going to want other things. So we have that ability for them to do that. It's all user initiated, the, the user initiated. Yep, it's all user initiated. Yep. They go through and define what they want uh, in Jenkins. Jenkins automates that process, and uh, 20, 30 minutes later, they have that image in their OpenStack tenant. Think of another question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <coughs> Yes. Um, you mean for like updates? Um, if you assign a floating IP. Well, I mean, it can, it can NAT outbound, right? So if it's in there, it can pull updates to, you know, the base. So if, if the user, so the, the thinking was to keep it, so for 30 days it's compliant, that's our policy. And then after 31 days, if there were patches, they do have the ability to pull patches out, uh, you know. Yes. Yep. If you want the latest version of whatever software uh, customized on your image, you'll have to go through and recreate the image. Yeah. Okay. I think we, sorry. So you, Still working? Yeah. <laughs> so a couple of slides back, you had uh, a security scan somewhere? Yeah, right over here. Yep. So when the, the customers come in and they modify the image to add whatever they want, do you right. go back into that flow and rerun the yep. scan on that custom image yes. and re-register? Yes, so if they obviously have install Apache or if they install some down-level version of something or whatever, which we don't want them, you know, which we ensure they don't do, um, then the scan would pick that up. So, I mean, if they're going to, regardless of, once they have that software installed on their image and they're out there in, product, uh, in testing, after, after a certain cycle, there's a scan that our security system has to do at a certain point in time on that instance to ensure that they're compliant. So, so you don't do that prior to making the image available to them? Well, we do. Yes, no, we do. We, may, we ensure that what they get is a compliant image, and the record that's in our security system indicates that out of the date of manufacture, this image has been made compliant. Moving forward, once it goes into the, uh, you know, when they run it within Nova. So it's always compliant while it's out there. When they provision, they know that they're getting an image that is fully compliant to our security specifications. Sorry, there was a gentleman right there had a question. I think it's, is it 30 days, Steve? I'm sorry, 
It, the version, the, how the time period we keep the image? Every yeah, every 30 days. We'll, we'll update well, it. We'll update it. Like so we, 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 we tend to keep like N minus one from, you're talking about like major releases, like, you know, as long as there's demand for a version and it's still being supported, we'll, we'll provide it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a management um, nightmare if, it, if, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a function of how many images. Your, your management cost is going to be a function of number of images, so we try to minimize that amount uh, while still maximizing what users need. So, okay. Question? Yeah, on yes. the previous slide, sure. uh, where you start with the ISO. Yes. A little. Hmm. Uh, do you have any plans on automating that? <coughs> is that a typo? Is that a type? <laughs> is it manual? Yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 So as you see right here, it's the major OS release is done once, and then upon that, once that's in the repository, it's patched upon that. So we don't have to do that again. So I mean, if 17, 17.04 comes out, they're going to do that manual process once more. But then when 17.04.1. One yes, yes. Okay. Any more questions? I'll just crank along here. I think I stood here. All right. And so here's a little scene behind Packer, um, the JSON. And as you see, kind of the, the, the YAML file that is used to create the user. Uh, I mean, create the you know, different components. We have the, uh, the type, what it is. OpenStack, the different regions, uh, the availability zones, and you know, we go down the, the list of the networking, the floating IP. Um, so this is what gets, excuse me, baked into the image as it gets created. Um, and just another look behind the scenes on the Jenkins job that will get kicked off to run Packer. And then if, you know, notification, once again, using Slack, notification if the job failed, succeeded, we go into Slack to ensure that the uh, functionality is there. Um, so the next slide here is that we had a bit of a, in the back previous slides, we had some IBM endpoint manager. And this is a, uh, if you heard of Big Fix, uh, this is a IBM security tool that we have optionally the end user can install on their image that the IBM endpoint manager can go out and maintain patching, compliance, um, a fairly large portfolio of software to do a lot of this work, but uh, it's used in IBM against, you know, against a lot of our images, uh, does a lot of uh, stuff behind the scenes to keep the images that are long-lived, and we'd only use this on a long-lived floating IP addressed uh, instance that's running out there. And it, and it handles more than just OS patching. It'll handle um, any sort of middleware or software um, that would require patching again. Uh, it's not, it doesn't have 100% coverage, but it's pretty close. Um, and it's really key to keeping instance level compliance um, ongoing for those rare cases where there are long living, right. long running VMs. We tend to try to drive users to um, minimize the number of long running VMs. OpenStack is all about dynamic uh, workload and provisioning when, they, when you need to and destroying as you're done. Question? So it's within our security tool. The, the end user has the ability, if they deem they want to have this function run against their machine, if they, you know, they just want to set it and forget it, then that will um, go off and do the patch management. It doesn't, I mean, the change control part of that. Um, well, it, that's what IT SAS is for. That's what, the, uh, yeah. The security tool IT SAS will, will basically make a notation that on this day, uh, uh, IBM Endpoint Manager applied these patches on this. So if we're in case of an audit, we have basically the record of history of how this instance was patched. So that change what happened on the uh, endpoint when the IBM endpoint manager happens. Like, so a problem we run into someone doesn't approve a change ticket. Right. So it doesn't get patched. Right. And then it goes to another site and it doesn't get patched. I'm just wondering how you guys deal with those types of compliance issues. 
So <clears throat> for these, we call these, um, so we classify things a little bit, our security classification. So these would be considered test and development machines where the change management rig rigor is not as, as a production facing machine. I mean, if it's like a critical patch, they'll get nag notes and yep. eventually get escalated. I mean, I'll go to their manager, the manager's manager, up, up through, I mean, it's, um, IT, we have a tool that does the change management that every, v, every image and instance um, is linked to. So any patch that needs to be applied, if it's a, you know, sev one critical patch, um, it, and it doesn't get patched, it'll eventually get escalated to, to their management. And let's see here, what else? All right. So also obviously our Windows machines, once they are, are our Windows instances, I might say, they are uh, managed by a KMS server. They come online. They automatically hit the KMS server to register, as people know, with uh, Windows doing unattended sysprep's and all that stuff can get kind of gnarly. Um, this kind of handles some of the key management for us, um, which is pretty good. I mean, I think it helps a lot of the uh, folks that are using Windows to register these things. And you know, it's as you see the numbers there, one KMS, about 150,000 instances where you basically were churning and burning instances, Windows, when we're doing tests. So we need to re-register. And so the outcome here. So we have common compliant images across the clouds. Um, you know, no compliance cost for 30 days. So you get a 30 day get out of jail free card. Um, and after that, if they continue to keep the image, then they'll have to maintain it within our security tool to have to patch it. Um, we integrate with our compliance system, which is key because we can't have machines that now are patched, unsecure, running on our network. As you see, we have an automated framework to customize uh, the spe specific stacks. Um, and the user experience from the image perspective is the same across all geographies. So we have the same look and feel. Um, and the reduced cost associated with that is you know, on average, we're saving around 16 hours, man hours per week across each location. So we don't have everybody doing it. We have a team that is cent uh, central that handles all of those for all the different geos. Um, and that duplication of effort that we've had at different sites, we have can free up the local IT teams to do other things and support our other functions within the team. And here's some numbers here about Big Fix. Um, some of the uh, different locations that they're in within the IBM Corporation and some of the patches and what they are doing across the, uh, the different geos. So fairly uh, robust environment there. And questions? Yes. Um, earlier you mentioned about customization. Yes. The, the end can do to the image. How are you doing that? It's via a request. It's a Jenkins job that gets through. Yeah, through they, go, they log into Jenkins. Jenkins. There's a UI that we have in Jenkins right, for them. Link to go here to yep. Your yep. Image and then right. Yep. It's a different menu as opposed to. Yep. Are there other questions? Yes. So you mentioned It, it's post-process that happens. So when the machine, so when the machine is actually built, it has knowledge of the KMS server and it knows where to register to. Okay, then you just it or? Pardon, I'm sorry. How, how do you um, configure that then? That was through, I believe, the sysprep preparation okay. when the it's image, the yeah, in the boot, yeah, it's in the bootstrap process. Other questions, yes. No, they're always registered within the, um, our security system. So because, right, because we actually have jobs, uh, so we have a listener that listens within the framework of OpenStack that sees something, there's a message queue that basically says, ah, oh, there's a new Windows instance, I'm gonna register it, it's a flow, you know, it has the FOSSI record associated with it, it belongs to this, this person, 
it's in there. And so each user within you know, the development teams has their own login to the security portal. So it would show up on their list as, okay, now you have a new, now new image within the security portal. Yeah. I mean, compliance is, is just about, is, it's not just about um, being safe and secure. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on audits, you know, making, just making sure everything's documented. So anything that touches the network, um, we're required to capture, you know, that it, this VM by this person um, with these characteristics and this OS touch the network, um, mostly for audit reasons. It's less about uh, being secure, to be honest. Plus, I mean, we, you know, we want to ensure that we're not going to have any malicious activity on the network, and yeah. you know, obviously, it goes into the product, so we want to make sure that there's no bad things going on. Yes. Yes. We don't uh, send our images out there. They're only within the blue network. They're not out to software. So, what do you, what do you guys use out there? so within software, it's um, they have their own methodology of provisioning. So, software. If you ordered a server, a Red Hat server, they would provision it for you. They have their own provisioning system. So, yeah, and I mean, if you would deploy, so if you were to just get bare metal and install OpenStack, then it would be a different story. We could use our own process out there. But if we just ordered bare metal, or if we ordered like a Windows CentOS, a, Windows, you know, a RHEL machine out there, they have automatically, they'll provision it for you. They have their own satellite servers. They have their own YAS servers. They have their own, you know, Kickstart servers for all that stuff. Today it's separate, but we've got a work item to try to uh, either host uh, soft layer images, you know, public cloud images uh, within our on-prem clouds, so then they can literally port them over. But today it's a recreate the workload in, in public cloud. Um, but we don't really have a good portability, workload portability, whether it's VMs or containers. Uh, we don't really have a good portability um, method from on-prem to public cloud. It's, it's more about enabling the connectivity between the two. Any more questions? Well, I thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy your event tonight. And uh, thanks for taking the time to talk, uh, listen to us.